This conference will now be recorded. Good evening. Welcome to the Thursday night Bible study. Tonight the topic is why Galatians chapter 1 and chapter 2 should have a very profound effect on your understanding of the Bible in a King James Bible. If you study Galatians chapter 1 and chapter 2, which we're going to look at tonight, with an understanding of some other relevant background facts that will give you a foundation to go into Galatians chapter 1 and chapter 2 without being biblically ignorant, then it will have a profound effect on you should and it will cause you to rightly divide the word of truth just as god instructs you to do in second timothy chapter 2 verse 15. but first let's get into some of those background foundational facts that you should go educated with into galatians 1 and galatians 2. so paul wrote 13 epistles he did not write the book of Hebrews. There's a biblical test, a Bible test in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm sorry, chapter 3. At the end of the chapter of the epistle that is written by Paul, he has this salutation in it, his greeting in it. And it's a token. It's called a token, an example of how you know whether it was written by Paul. All of the epistles from Romans through Philemon have that token in them they all start with one word in a king james bible paul hebrews does not have that but those 13 epistles of paul if you go before them most of them in time you have the book of acts the book of acts was written by luke luke authenticated the apostles apostleship of paul the Holy Spirit, I should say, through Luke, because the Holy Spirit was coming through Luke and wrote the Word of God, the book of Acts. And most of the book of Acts, the majority of it, is about the ministry of the Apostle Paul. And it starts off and explains how Jesus Christ appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus, brighter than the noonday sun, and blinded Paul. When Paul was going to Damascus, Syria, to round up more Christians and have them murdered because he hated Christians and he did not believe in Jesus Christ as the Messiah God of Israel. But his mind was changed in the book of Acts, and most of the book of Acts is about Paul's ministry. So you have Luke authenticating him, and when you understand the book of Acts, you see it starts in Jerusalem with the apostle to Israel, and it's Israel focused at the beginning of the book of Acts. The apostle to Israel is Peter. And it starts with the gospel of the kingdom, the good news of the kingdom to Israel and to the world through Israel. Then the book of Acts transitions and it ends in Rome, the Gentile world capital, Jerusalem, the Jewish world capital, Rome, the Gentile world capital. And it transitions away from Peter, the apostle to Israel, to Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. And it transitions away from the gospel of the kingdom to the gospel of the grace of God, which was given by Paul to Paul by revelation, which we're going to learn tonight in Galatians 1. But then when you go on the other side of the epistles of Paul, you have Peter authenticating Paul in 2 Peter and authenticating Paul's writings and epistles as the word of God, as scripture. And those that wrestle with it, wrestle with it as they do the other scripture. And he authenticates that scripture as word of God. And of course, the epistles of Paul are presented as the word of God in places such as 1 Corinthians chapter 14. People make the mistake of saying, well, Paul teaches us this and Paul teaches us that. Well, they miss the point that it's the word of God coming through Paul 
that authenticates itself as the word of God. But then something else that we should understand before we go to Galatians 1 and 2. And that is, you can look at the content of the gospel that Paul preaches. And you can see the contractual terms of the gospel that Paul preaches. And they include simply believing that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day. Or in another place, believing Jesus Christ was delivered for our offenses, was raised from the dead. And when somebody, somebody simply believes that, without any works plus nothing else, they get eternal life as a free gift in Romans 6.23. They get righteousness as a free gift from God Almighty to them in Romans chapter 3 and Romans chapter 5. They get salvation as a free gift. In Ephesians chapter 2, without works, simply by believing. And then you compare that to the gospel given to Peter. And Peter's gospel includes, in Acts 2.38, water baptism. They have to repent and be baptized, every one of them, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of their sins. Well, in Paul's gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, there is no water baptism. Paul's gospel, Romans 3, Romans 4 and 5, there is no water baptism. That's a work. It doesn't exist there. In Paul's gospel, in Ephesians 2, not one single word about water baptism anywhere in Romans through Philemon for salvation. Rather, we learn Paul was not sent by Jesus Christ to water baptize in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. That's a Bible fact that you should understand. Peter was sent to water baptize, not only in Acts 2.38, not only in Mark 16, but in Matthew 28. He was sent to water baptize. Why? The gospel of the, of the kingdom includes water baptism. People say, oh, that was before the cross. No. All of those places I just cited were after the cross. Israel was given a water baptism gospel. Paul was not, even though he baptized early in his ministry and circumcised adult males. I mean, the very thought of it, but he did that. We are told circumcision in his epistles availeth nothing. It does nothing for you. Water baptism is not found there. You look at the gospel that was given to Peter in Acts, well, Matthew chapter 10. It include, included enduring on the end to be saved. Matthew chapter 24, included enduring on to the end to be saved, includes works, works, and works, plus faith. Matthew 25, blessing other believers so that you can get eternal life. Matthew 19, keeping commandments, selling all you have, forsaking everything. That's a gospel that was given to Peter. Not so in the gospel given to Paul, there are no works involved. You go to the other side of the epistles of Paul, Hebrews 3, Hebrews 6, Hebrews 10, all includes works. You have to keep that firm onto the end or you're not a partaker of Christ. That's the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus Christ defined it that way. You got to endure on the end to be saved. In the book of Revelations, you got to die for Christ. If you do not keep his commandments, you're not a partaker of him. If you take the mark of the beast, you are a lost person. You're going to suffer God's wrath. The same in Hebrews 10 in, in the book of Peter, in John chapter 3. You have got, if you, if you sin after a certain point in John 3, you're the devil, you never knew Christ. First John, I'm sorry, First John chapter 3. So that's consistent with what Peter was taught and sent to preach. But Paul's gospel is a mystery. No works, no enduring on to the end to be saved, no water baptism for, for salvation. No forgiving others as Peter was taught by Christ so that you can have your sins forgiven by God in Matthew 6. No, that's not in the epistles of Paul. We're taught we already are forgiven and a major difference. Peter taught that their sins were blotted out in Acts 3.19 at the second coming of Christ. Well, what about in Paul's gospel? We're taught that our sins are already forgiven. Ephesians 1.7, Colossians 1.14. He's also forgiven us all trespasses 
God, for Christ's sake, has already forgiven us. We're not waiting for the second coming of Christ to be forgiven because we are already forgiven. Isn't that awesome? So these are different contracts. Any lawyer, first year law student, now they'll say, forget about lawyers, just start with a first year law student. If you presented these as contracts, they would say they're completely different in all these material terms. Even though they all contain Jesus Christ, one has water baptism, one doesn't. One has sins blotted out when Jesus returns. One has somebody's sins already being forgiven and blotted out. One includes repentance and all these other works like keeping commandments and enduring on the end to be saved. One doesn't have any of those things. One doesn't have any works at all. First year law student would understand that. In fact, a kindergarten student would understand these things are different. Are these different? Yes. Are those things different? Yes. But you have a lot of religious folks running around saying there's only one gospel in the Bible. Somebody has brainwashed them into believing that mantra, into believing that slogan. So they run around with these slogans. There's only one gospel in the Bible. And then when you say, well, what about Acts 2.38 and 3.19? Compare that to 1 Corinthians 15 where there's no water baptism in Mark 16 where there's baptism and here there's no water baptism compare the gospel on Abraham it has none of the things about the preaching of the cross of Paul's gospel so I'm covering a lot of ground I hope you look up the verses yourself if you're not familiar with them because I wanted to get to Galatians 1 and 2 and this was the way to cover a lot of ground but I must bring up some other things there's a lot of verses that show that a new gospel was given to Paul, that it started with him. He laid the foundation and he was the very first one in the pattern. So you can look at the contracts and see they're different gospel, salvational contracts. You can look at things and a lot of other supporting factors that every Christian should be armed with these because they will know how they're gonna get to heaven and get eternal life because that is inevitable for them in this time of grace when they simply believe the gospel. And they'll realize that Peter's gospel is going to be preached. The gospel of the kingdom and the great tribulation, the seven years of horror, we're not in that time. And they'll realize there's only one gospel for today, true. The gospel of the grace of God, which is given to Paul, Paul's gospel. But I'm not going to just whiz through a lot of these verses. I'm not going to go over a lot of them because I'm going to get to the main point of tonight's Bible study about the profound impact that if you are armed with those foundational facts that I discussed, and you go to Galatians 1 and 2, your Christian understanding of the scripture should never be the same. But I want to show you something. So I mentioned the scripture teaches how things started with Paul. That gospel was given to him by revelation of God. We're going to study tonight. That's not the only thing, though. Turn to Ephesians chapter 3, the dispensation of the grace of God. And we're going to go rather quickly through some of these. Paul is the only one that mentions the dispensation of the grace of God. It was given him by revelation. It's not found anywhere else in the Bible. And it was a mystery given to him by revelation. That's Bible fact 101. Any kindergartner can understand this or second or first or second grader. Uh, Ephesians 3, for this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to your word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. Yes, by revelation, this whole dispensation of the grace of God was made known unto Paul. What is it? It is that you get eternal life, a promise of God to you, and the promises of Christ to you, that applies to you. You become a member of Christ, the church, the body of Christ, the same body. You become a, an heir, a joint heir with God Almighty by simply believing that he died for you and he was buried and raised from the dead for you. Simply believing that gospel of the preaching of the cross given to Paul, all those things apply to you. It's a mystery, absolute mystery. Nobody else mentions it in the Bible, but you see how it was given to Paul by revelation of God, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. If you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me, that's Paul, to you word. That's how it works. It was given from him to us. And this is what we should be teaching people today. Because this revelation of the mystery of the dispensation of the grace of God, it is the only thing that explains why Christ has not returned and set up his kingdom on this earth yet. 
why the Great Tribulation has not happened yet, why the world has not gone through the seven years of tribulation yet, because God had a mystery time where he wanted to save all these people for free without religion, without works, without sacraments, without water baptism, without church membership, without any of that stuff. If they would simply believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and get saved. And he made it so easy that everybody and anybody can get saved. And it is his will. He saves them for free because he loves them and wants them to be raised into eternal glory because of the work he did for you. And just all you have to do is believe it at one point in your life. He created the dispensation of the grace of God. Give it, gave it to Paul by revelation of Jesus Christ. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. I'm showing you things that started with Paul, that he was the first one in the pattern of those things. He's the only one that's called the trustee, by the way, of that gospel that was given to him. That's legal terminology. Uh, this glorious gospel, by the way, that gives you eternal glory. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11. This gives you eternal glory. It's appropriately named the glorious gospel of the blessed God because it gives you eternal glory, an eternal way to glory. First Corinthians, uh, uh, second uh, uh, Corinthians chapter four. Okay, that's what you're gonna experience. These aren't just words. You're gonna experience this eternal glory forever. When you're resurrected from the dead or you're raptured out of this world, you're gonna feel that these are not words that don't have an impact on how you're going to feel forever. These words are going to be your experience and your being forever. This glory you're going to experience forever. But getting to the point here, according to the glorious gospel, the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. Now, why is this man not including Peter, James, and John in all of this? Why is he saying to my trust? Well, we're going to find that gospel was given to him. He calls it my gospel in. Romans chapter 2, he calls it my gospel. In uh, Romans chapter 16, he calls it my gospel. In 2 Timothy, it was given to him by revelation. That's why he calls, says it was committed to his trust. And he was the very first one in the pattern of that gospel where all you do to receive eternal life is believe. He was the very first one. How do I know that? Because the Bible teaches that right here in 1 Timothy chapter 1. He was a blasphemer before. He was a persecutor. He was having Christians rounded up and killed. Verse 13. Uh, you could study that yourself. Find out what he was doing. He was trying to round them up and have more of them killed and slaughtered in Damascus, Syria, when Jesus Christ appeared on to him and blinded him. After Christ had been uh, ascended up into glory, he came back to this earth and met with Paul. And that changed Paul's mind. Verse 16, how be it for this cause, I obtained mercy. Paul obtained mercy. What was the purpose of it? He obtained mercy that in me first. I want you to think about that. Here's what the Bible is teaching you. Oh, Mark, you're saying that it was in Paul first, but no. Peter, James, and John were preaching the same thing in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's not true. Peter, James, and John did not even understand that Jesus was going to be raised from the dead. They did not preach that in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John at the beginning or through the, those, those books. They did not understand it. They didn't understand he was going to die. Peter rebuked Christ when Christ said he was going to die. And Christ rebuked Peter as Satan. When Jesus was raised from the dead, those apostles, Peter, James, and John, were unbelievers because. People told them eyewitnesses Jesus was raised from the dead. Look at the end of the book of Mark. And you know what they did? They didn't say, praise God, we've been teaching that for years. No, they did not. They didn't believe it. They were unbelievers of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So that's not what the Bible teaches. That's another one of these fairy tales that are part of uh, church mantras, that they're all teaching the same gospel. They were teaching there. That Christ is going to die for you, be raised from the dead, and believe in that, you get eternal life for free. No, find one single place where they ever teach that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, where the apostles teach it. Not where Jesus Christ is telling Nicodemus by night, John 3.16. No, where the apostles ever teach it. They didn't understand he was going to die. That's what the Bible teaches. But watch this. 
uh, be it for this cause, I obtain mercy. Paul obtained mercy. And our salvation is a mercy salvation. That in me first, Paul was the first one, Jesus Christ might shoot forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter be water baptized as what Christ sent Peter to do in Mark 16? No. Be water baptized for the remission of sins, which is what Peter taught in Acts 3, uh, 2.38? No. It's not there. Be water baptized as Jesus sent them out to do in Matthew 28? No, that's not found here. Be water baptized, which is what Peter taught. I forgot whether it's first or second Peter, that how baptism does now save us. I think it's in second Peter, but I could be wrong. It might be in first Peter. No, that's not here. For a pattern to them, and Paul first, and me first, Jesus Christ might shoot forth all long suffering for a pattern to them, which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. It's as simple as that. Believe on him to life everlasting. No church membership, no sacraments, no works. Oh, none of that. Believe on him to life everlasting. Paul was the one that laid the very foundation of your judgment, by the way. That salvational foundation was laid by Paul. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Go towards the end of the, uh, end of the chapter. Verse 10, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. Those are the words of God, by the way. That's the Holy Spirit coming through him. So if you fight with this, that Paul laid the foundation, that he was the first one in the pattern of salvation, just, just by believing, you're fighting with him, laying the foundation and not wanting it to be found in Mark and, and, and Luke and Matthew. What you're fighting with is you're fighting with God. Because this is what he's teaching. Paul laid the foundation. I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. Let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay that, and that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So it's not only the contractual terms of different gospels between Peter and Paul, uh, but it is these verses that point out that something happened with him, which he was the first one that did. He laid the foundation. And it was in him first. But of course, he is the one that is your apostle, preacher, minister, and teacher of Jesus Christ to you. It is not Peter. Peter is an apostle to Israel. And if he was sent to the nations, it was sent to the nations with the prominence of Israel and Israel's gospel, the kingdom. He was not the one given the gospel of the grace of God, Peter. No, he was not. So I should have continued in first in First Timothy chapter two and showed you. This is all building on that foundation that you need to understand. And it's going to make Galatians 1 with your understanding. It's not just your understanding. You've got to believe God. So with you believing these verses, it's going to make Galatians 1 profoundly affect, should make you profoundly affect your understanding of the Bible and drive you to rightly divide the word of truth, which is what God tells you to do anyway. So Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 2. Um, the context is that God's will is that everybody be saved. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, verse 3. God our Savior, that's another name for Jesus. He's God our Savior, which is what he is. Who will have all men to be saved and to come under the knowledge of the truth. That's what the dispensation of the grace of God is. Is God deluding a lot of people like he's going to be doing in the great tribulation right now? It doesn't say that. No, he will in the future. He's going to delude those in the great tribulation. Because he finally, the time will come where he's going to have it with all of us. And our sins and our crimes and our murders and our evil and our wicked ways and our wars. He's going to have it with us. And they don't want to believe God and believe the truth. And the great tribulation is going to delude them. But not now. Now, he wills that all people be saved. Verse 4. Come on to the knowledge of the truth. Now, is he limiting that to a frozen chosen as John Calvin would? The limited atonement? No, of course not. God is not a Calvinist. He wants everyone to be saved and to come on to the knowledge of the truth. The elect in the time of grace are those that believe the gospel. You're given free choice. Believe it or reject it. God does do his part, but you got to do your part by believing it. He wants all men to be saved. But what about Paul? Why are we getting to Paul? Because verse 6, he, he gave himself a ransom for all. Again, John Calvin's limited atonement of the 
reform movement is completely destroyed. Again, in another verse, there's so many verses like that. They don't rightly divide the word of truth, a lot of them. Gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, whereunto I, that's Paul, am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. If you're a Gentile, you've got a preacher of Jesus Christ to you. Peter, he told Peter not to go to the Gentiles in Matthew 10. Even when he did send them to the nations, it was Israel, Jerusalem first, then Judea, then Samaria, then the uttermost parts of the world, and then it's the gospel of the kingdom. Well, Paul was sent to you. God's message to you. You have a preacher of Jesus Christ, you a teacher of Jesus Christ, you an apostle of Jesus Christ to you. That's Paul. Now, with that understanding and that background, let's turn to Galatians chapter 1. And would there be the gospel in Galatians 1? Of course, it's found in almost every epistle of Paul. Very few exceptions. You're going to see the truth, the truth that we're saved by. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Verse 1 of Galatians 1, verse 1 of Galatians 1. Paul, an apostle, not a man, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. That's part of our gospel. He raised Jesus from the dead. Do you believe it? If you believe that and you believe he died for our sins, and we still live for our offenses, you're a saved person. Where can we find him dying for our sins in Galatians 1? Surely it's there. Yes, it is. Go to verse 4. Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. Yes, that's what he's going to do. Deliver us from this present evil world. Now, there was a problem with false teachers Everywhere Paul went, people were trying to stone him. People were trying to kill him. People who even believed in Christ were trying to contradict him. People were trying to put his, those that had gotten saved, under religious systems. Tried to force them into some religion and church somewhere. They were false apostles and preachers and teachers swarming around Paul wherever he went. Paul wanted them to be killed off, actually. He got so sick of them. He wanted them to be cut off that we're perverting the gospel of Christ. But I want you to, I want to show you what should profoundly change or affect and impact your view of the, of the Bible. Watch this verse six. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ onto another gospel. So these people were saved by grace. And they so quickly went away from grace. I noticed that when you teach somebody about grace, they'll get somebody in their church. Often it's a pastor or somebody else trying to say that's, that's wrong. But often they don't have a biblical reason to deny the truth of the Bible. They often won't understand it. But what they'll normally do is go outside of the Bible and just call you names for teaching the Bible. Hyper dispensationalists or say you're a false teacher or uh, that you're preaching a false gospel or some nonsense. Here, though, he marveled how quickly they were removed from him that called them into the grace of Christ. That's their salvation is grace. And they got away from that onto another gospel. But that gospel that was being taught by these other people was not a gospel of God. Verse 7, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So they were taking them away from the grace gospel and they were teaching them a gospel that wasn't even a gospel of God. Now, some people will use this, which is not another, but there'll be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. They actually use this to show there's only one gospel in the Bible. They say, oh, in Galatians, there's only one gospel in the Bible. Ask, ask yourself this question when you think about this verse right now. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ onto another gospel. Is that telling you there's no other gospels in the Bible? There's only one? It is not. No. 
it says, which is not another. That gospel they were removing them from was not another gospel, another good news from God. Okay. It was instead, but there'd be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. This isn't teaching you there's more than one gospel in the Bible, because in Galatians 2, you're going to learn there are two different gospels in Galatians 2 alone. There are two different gospels operating. So obviously, this would be illogical in chapter 1 to say there's only one gospel in the Bible. Oh, but in Galatians 2, there are two. You could study the gospels through the Old Testament and the New and see what, what God taught them in the wilderness, where they had to keep with God in order to... Uh, inherit the rest of the promised land was a gospel. Did it include works? Of course it did. You can see in Matthew 25, there's a gospel in there where they get eternal life by blessing the brethren. Did it include works? Of course it did. You can see in Galatians here, Galatians 4, there's a reference to a gospel unto Abraham even. In Galatians 4, there's a third gospel that's taught right there. Um, and there's a gospel unto Abraham. And does does that mean that in the book of Galatians, and did I get it wrong? It's, it's in Galatians 4, I believe. Um, and there's a reference to the gospel on Abraham, and it's in, it's in Galatians. But is the gospel on Abraham, when gospel, when Abraham was told those things, was, um, was he ever taught that you're going to believe that Jesus dies for you and is raised from the dead, Abraham, and, that, and when his resurrection from the dead is going to give you eternal life? Of course he wasn't. But it's called the gospel on Abraham. And um, so obviously there's more than one gospel, multiple gospels, because it simply means uh, the, uh, it simply means the good news from God to man. It means that God is a good, glad tidings and good news from God Almighty to man. Okay, that's what it means. Let's get back to Galatians 1. That's what gospel means. And there are lots of gospels in the Bible. But for today, there's only one gospel you should be preaching. So they were perverting the gospel of Christ in, uh, in verse 7. Some that trouble you will pervert the gospel of Christ. And here's the standard for today. This is one of the things that should, as I say, profoundly affect you. This should have a, uh, it should have a great, give you great knowledge and insight to guide you through the rest of the scriptures. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you. Well, if you just preached it unto us, Christ died for us and Christ was raised from the dead. But if any doubt about it, go to 1 Corinthians 15 and see the one he preached on to them, because that word is used, preached. The one that they had received, and that word is used in 1 Corinthians 15, and it's a preaching of the cross. Him dying on the cross for us, him being buried, him being raised from the dead. We believe it. We get immortality. We get uh, immortality. We get an incorruptible body one day. We get raised in glory from the dead. We get raised in power from the dead. And all those promises in 1 Corinthians 15. But today, though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you. So this would include the angel uh, Moroni that uh, appeared unto Joseph Smith. This would include the angel Gabriel that uh, apparently appeared unto Muhammad. They weren't preaching this grace gospel. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you. Let him be accursed. That's a curse of God. That statement of curse to God is an abomination, means that it's an abomination in the eyes of God. And God is going to burn up those abominations. Look at the Old Testament examples, okay, of that. This is a very horrible condition to be a curse of God. But if Paul, though we, came around preaching any other gospel than the one he had preached then, and this is by authority of the Holy Spirit, this is the Holy Spirit, this is God speaking through Paul. If you think you're a spiritual person, you have to acknowledge the things that he writes unto you are the commandments of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 14. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you. Let him be accursed. 
they would be accursed if they came preaching any other gospel. The angel is accursed, Moroni or Gabriel, whoever they call themselves, if they're preaching any other gospel for this time of grace. You're not in the great tribulation. There is another gospel for the great tribulation. You're not there. You're in the time of grace, the dispensation of the grace of God we read about. There's only seven years of great tribulation. And the gospel of the kingdom, another gospel applies to that great tribulation. Not today. They're accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. Any man, it doesn't matter what they are or who they call themselves, what denomination they are, what kind of Christian they are. I'm telling you, if they're including works and salvation, that's another gospel. So they're saying you have to repent of your sins to be saved. That's another gospel. I don't like that. I don't go with that. Because 1 Corinthians 15 has no repenting of sins for salvation. Galatians didn't have any. Ephesians doesn't have any. Romans 3, 4, 5 has no repenting of sins. Now you're to repent of your unbelief. So there's a place for repentance. It means you have a change of heart from being an unbeliever in the preaching of the cross to being a believer in the preaching of the cross. Just like Peter, James, and John, when Jesus was, was died, died on the cross, and then eyewitnesses had seen that he was raised from the dead, they didn't believe it. Peter, James, and John were unbelievers. And then when Jesus finally appeared on him, why? Eyewitnesses came to them and said, he's risen. And they didn't believe it. And then Jesus had to appear on to them and he rebuked them. He rebuffed them. He actually scolded them because they were unbelievers in his resurrection that the eyewitnesses told him about. These are the same men that have been teaching the gospel of the kingdom and performing miracles for over three years with Jesus. And they didn't believe he was raised from the dead. So don't go around teaching. That's what they were teaching back then in Matthew and Mark and Luke. They didn't understand it. But when they saw Jesus, they believed it because he appeared unto them after his resurrection. But here, if any man preaches any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. Now watch this very carefully. This should have a profound effect on you. It did on me. It had such a profound effect on me when I saw this. But I certify you, brethren, so that the gospel which was preached to me is not after man. He never got it from Ananias in the book of Acts. Some people say, oh, he got it from Ananias in the book of Acts. Well, why don't you believe Galatians 1? The gospel that he preached is not after a man. For I neither received it of man. It wasn't from Ananias. Neither was I taught it by any man. You see that? He didn't receive it of man, neither was he taught it. No man came up to him and taught it to him. How did he get it then? But by revelation of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ revealed this gospel to him. Jesus Christ revealed it to him. Some say in Acts 9, some say in Acts 13. Look, the real important point is he got it by revelation from Jesus Christ. And he was the first one in the pattern of salvation by simply believing. That's what we read in 1 Timothy 1. And he laid the foundation of the salvation by grace through faith. That's what we read in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, Paul compares himself to these 10,000 instructors in Christ that somebody might have. The whole world, 10,000 instructors from whatever denomination, compares all of those to him. And he explains, you might have those 10,000 instructors, but Paul was the one that gave birth to them through the gospel that he called my gospel, Romans 2, my gospel, Romans 16, my gospel in 2 Timothy. He didn't receive that gospel from any man. He got it directly by revelation of Jesus Christ. That's why it's different from what Peter preached in Acts 2, 38 and Acts 3, 19. That's why he has no water baptism. It's a different gospel. You see that? He got it by revelation of Jesus Christ. Where's the water baptism? In Galatians 1, we didn't see it. We saw Christ dying for us. We saw him being raised. We didn't see any water baptism. Where's the water baptism? In 1 Corinthians 15, it isn't there. In Ephesians 2, and not there. In the book of Romans for salvation, not there. You can boldly stand on Romans 10 where it says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, that God hath raised him, believe in thine heart, that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. That means you're safe from death because God's going to raise you from the dead. You're safe from death. you got eternal life forever. 
And you can know that if you simply believe that gospel. And God has a litmus test of salvation in Romans 10, where you know, hey, you've confessed to God that Jesus is Lord. You believed in your heart he was raised from the dead. You obviously believed he died for you on the cross. Then you can know you're saved from death. That's the primary thing you're saved from, being a dead soul. You're going to run out of life, and God's going to give you eternal life. One day. This was given by revelation to Paul from Jesus Christ directly. He gets into how you heard of me, my conversation in time past in the Jews religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, profited in the Jews religion. He wasted the church of God. He had them killed. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace and mercy salvation, that's how we get saved, and that's what you should be teaching people to. Not church membership and water baptism, doing sacraments and doing all these works. No, mercy, salvation, saving by grace. To reveal in his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen. He actually went to the Jew first. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me. He distinguishes himself from these men. Peter, James, and John. Why? He was given a new gospel. He had to teach it to them by revelation. He didn't go up to these men. He went to Arabia. Later, he returned to Damascus. After three years, he goes to Jerusalem to see Peter. Verse 19, he makes a, deal about, a big deal about of the, of the apostles, but other of the apostles saw I none, save James, the Lord's brother. Okay, and he's very bold about that. Then, don't miss out on what, what this is going to teach you in Galatians 2. Do not miss it. Do not miss it. Okay. 17 years later, at least it's over 17 years. You can't figure out the timeline. I haven't been able to. It's at least probably over 17 years after he got that gospel and got saved, went to Arabia and all these other things happened. You, you go in Galatians 2, then 14 years after what? 14 years after his first trip to Jerusalem or 14 years after he left Antioch. And you can interpret that for yourself in Galatians 1. But let's get to the point. Galatians 2, 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, took Titus with me. And I went up by revelation. So Paul received that gospel by revelation. And then of Jesus Christ. And he goes up at least 17 years after he got this gospel. He goes up again to Jerusalem. And by revelation, God is revealing to these people in Jerusalem. This gospel, which he preached among the Gentiles, including Peter, James, and John. They are among these people. Okay? Look at verse 9. When James, Cephas, and John, who seem to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me. That's a salvational grace. That's the whole context of this chapter. Is this gospel of salvation that Paul was given by revelation. That he taught James and Peter and John by revelation 17 years after Paul received it. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them. That gospel, which I preach among the Gentiles. But privately to them, which were of reputation. Lest by any means I should run or I had run in vain. And there were false gospel, false people there. He was compelled to. Uh, they tried to get Titus to be circumcised. So there's other things going on. There always is. There's always opposition to the truth of the Bible. Always will be. And generally from religious people, primarily, greatest opposers, okay? But you have opposition from atheists and others as well. But what happened? So he, by revelation, communicates unto the believers in Jerusalem that believed in Jesus Christ, that gospel. Why is he doing that by revelation if it's the same one they had? Because it's not the same one. God doesn't have to reveal through Paul a gospel he's preaching on the Gentiles if it's the same one. That Peter, James, and John are already preaching. Of course, it's not the same one. You could look at the contracts. 
that we already discussed that, Acts 2.38, Acts 3.19, places like Mark, uh, uh, you can look at Mark 16, the water baptism, Matthew 28, the water baptism, Acts 2.38, Acts 3.19, water baptism, sins blotted out the second coming of Christ, which is Old Testament 101 for Israel. That's when their sins are blotted out. And then you can see in Paul's gospel, Jew and Gentile alike are already forgiven. Their sins are already blotted out in Ephesians 1, 7. So we already discussed that. So he had to reveal this by revelation to these Jews of Jerusalem, the believing Jews as well. Now what happened here? Watch this, verse 7. But contrawise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision Here's a name that the Bible gives a gospel. Use an accurate Bible, by the way. Use a King James. Other versions have it wrong, just like they do Mark chapter 1. Study Mark 1 and see how these other versions are inaccurate in Mark 1. They're inaccurate here, too. So one of the reasons I don't trust them. Use a King James. Contrawise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision, that's Gentiles, was committed unto me, even though it went to Jews first, it's called the gospel of the uncircumcision. You are a Gentile, you have a gospel with a your name on it. If you're a Jewish person, this gospel goes to you first. Okay, in Romans 1.16, it is available for everybody, Jew and Gentile alike. But they saw this gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, unto Paul, nobody else It's mentioned. When they saw the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, how they see it? Go back up to verse 2. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. Paul, God Almighty revealed through Paul a new gospel to these people. The gospel of the uncircumcision. Might have revealed the dispensation of the grace of God to them at that point. I don't know. It doesn't say that here. That gospel and the indispensation of the grace of God, this gospel is a mystery. It wasn't preached by Peter in Acts 2.38 and 3.19. It wasn't preached in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You don't even see it clearly in the book of Acts. This gospel is preached uniquely. In the epistles of Paul, there are elements of it in other places, but they learned it from Paul. So at some point in time, maybe it was included in, in John and, and uh, you know, in, in other places, sprinklings of it, but it's not the same thing. It's not identical. So he, by revelation, he revealed it to these men. He revealed it, God did, by revelation through Paul, and they learned something. They saw something. They saw, contrawise when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, unto Paul. I wish everybody in America and everybody in the world and every Christian from every pulpit would see, would see this. If they, I wish they would just see the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed to Paul. I wish they would see the revelation of the mystery given to Paul. A lot of them don't. If you try to share it with them, they call you bad names because they don't understand it. They've never been taught that. And they'll say, nobody else has taught me that, so therefore what you're teaching is wrong. I've heard that before from otherwise intelligent people. It surprised me. That's their defense, not the Bible. I asked them, stay with the Bible. They're saying, no, I've learned from a lot of great people. Nobody taught me that. And therefore, what you're teaching, nobody teaches that. So what you're teaching might be wrong, must be wrong. That's our only defense. But contrawise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, that's Paul. That's one gospel there. As the gospel of the circumcision. Oh, another name for another gospel. How interesting is that? As the gospel of the circumcision, that's Israel's gospel, because that's the name of Israel. They are the circumcision, was committed unto Peter. That was committed to Peter. Gospel of the uncircumcision was committed to Paul. Gospel of the circumcision was committed unto Peter. This is long after the cross. Who is Peter the apostle to? Verse 8, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision. That's Israel. He is the apostle to Israel. The same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas, which is Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived, so they saw that was committed to him by revelation of God to them through Paul, 
Then they perceived the grace, salvational grace, that was given unto me, unto Paul. This salvational grace, they perceived it because that's what a gospel is about, good news from God to you, salvationally. They perceived this grace, this salvation grace that was given to Paul. And I wish everybody in America would perceive that. And everybody in the world would perceive that. What did they do? They gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we, Barnabas and Paul, should go on to the heathen. That's another name for Gentiles. And they, who are they going to? They're surely going forth with the Great Commission, right? To all the nations. They would go to all the nations following the Great Commission. There's no such thing as Great Commission in the Bible, by the way. There's nothing that says that. That's a man-made term. And that's fine. I know what they're replying it to. That's not what it says here. Nothing of the sort. No. What it says is that Paul would go to the heathen. And what they bound on earth was bound in heaven. Paul would go to the Gentiles. And they, Peter, James, and John, would go to who? What does it say at the end of verse 9? They would go, they unto the circumcision. They unto the circumcision. That's Israel. Peter and James and John, it was agreed and bound on earth as it is in heaven. They had that power to do that. Would go to Israel. Paul would go to the Gentiles. They're not going to all the nations of all the Gentiles. No, people try to say that's what they're doing. That's, that's not what they're doing 17 years after Paul got that gospel. Guess where they are here? Peter, James, and John going at all the nations right now? They're not. All these years later, they are still in Jerusalem. First one, I went up again to Jerusalem. That's where all this is happening in Jerusalem. They are still in Jerusalem. I'm not saying they're limited to there because they got scattered abroad by the persecutions. The Jews were, and they went initially only preaching to the Jews. And these same men at the end of the book of Acts point out the Jews in Jerusalem. They're still in Jerusalem and they're saying all the Jews in Jerusalem, how they're all zealous of the law, the believing Jews in Jerusalem. Why? Because Jesus Christ taught them to keep the law. And that's part of their gospel in effect. How that is going to apply to the great tribulation gospel, the kingdom, are they going to be taught to keep the law? I don't know what to tell you about that other than if you look at the book of Revelations, okay, you got to do his commandments to get eternal life in the last book of the book of Revelations, chapter 22. Um, you got to do his commandments to get eternal life. And they're, you know, if they sin after some point, they're of the devil. They never knew Christ. In 1 John chapter 3, it's a very different works-oriented gospel. Very different. Your job is to let people know how to get saved today. By, by free, I mean, I'm sorry, for free. By simply believing Christ died for you on the cross and he was buried and he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15. And then you can point to them and say, just believe in verse 11, like these people believe, and you're going to get this at the end of that chapter. You're going to be raised in mortal, be raised in corrupt, be raised in glory. You're going to be raised in power, and death won't have any power. It's going to be swallowed up in victory. And God gave you the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ at the end of 1 Corinthians 15. That's your job. Okay, now you have all this background. You have this understanding, Galatians 1 and 2. You're armed and you're equipped, as I am. But you're also armed and equipped to warn people. If they find themselves in the great tribulation, if that Jewish temple is built, if the two witnesses of God, Moses and Elijah, are prophesying from Jerusalem, you are in a different time. And these people that say there's only one gospel in the whole Bible, they are misleading those people in the great tribulation. Because those people in the great tribulation must endure on to the end to be saved. They have to die and they have to get decapitated for Christ. If they deny Christ and save their lives, they lose their souls. That's part of the gospel of the kingdom. That's what enduring on to the end means. What does a profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses, soul, loses his soul? Jesus warned them about that. That's a stern warning. They turn from him, they suffer wrath. They take the mark of the beast, 
They worship the image of the beast. They associate with the Antichrist in any way. They're going to suffer the wrath of God forever. Read about that in the book of Revelations. You're to warn people about that. I always warn people about that. That if they find themselves in the great tribulation, they're out of grace now. Follow the gospel of the kingdom. Be water baptized for the remission of sins. I would go to Jerusalem and flee into the mountains of Judea like Christ told them to do when they see the Antichrist get in the holy place. I would join myself to them. Because that's a different gospel found there. Jesus Christ said so in Matthew 24. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world and then shall the end come. And what did he teach? He that endureth unto the end shall be saved. Completely different gospel. And you have this gospel of the circumcision. This gospel of the circumcision, I'm convinced, is identical with the gospel of the kingdom. That's what it's called right here. Two different gospels operating in the book of Galatians. The gospel of the circumcision. Who was it committed to? Peter. That's why he's teaching in Acts 3.19. They have to wait till the second coming of Christ for their sins to be blotted out. That is the gospel, the good news in, to Israel in the Old Testament. That's when their inequities are forgiven. That's when their inequities are purged. That's when their sins are done away with in the book of Daniel, in the book of Zechariah, and all these other places. So obviously Peter's preaching that in Acts 3.19. And he's telling you that's when Christ returns. That's the times of the refreshing that are going to come from the presence of the Lord is when their sins are blotted out. So we see right here in Galatians, Peter was the apostle to Israel. Peter was given as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, committed unto Peter. I'm going to end it there tonight. I covered a lot of ground. Get established in Galatians 1 and 2. And the other foundational truths we looked at tonight, that the gospel is clear for today. And we know what we should be preaching today. And we know that our apostle, preacher, minister, and teacher of Jesus Christ to us was given the foundation. First, he laid it. And he was the first one in the pattern that believes on Jesus Christ to life everlasting. Thank you for listening. Thank you for partaking in this Bible study tonight. Good night and God bless you.